has promised, I will give a clean derivation of the relationship you see above concerning the second order normal derivative of a function u defined in the entire ambient space. This will be a general derivation. We've derived this expression before, but we did it by assuming that we've introduced the Cartesian coordinate system in the ambient space. It was a clean proof, but somewhat distasteful given the framework of tensor calculus. We like doing things generally, without introducing special coordinate systems and using any special features of the coordinate system. That adherence to generality is a very positive thing that leads to a more general, more broad, more effective view. So that's what we're going to do now. We will relate this quantity, which has an invariant definition. I'll remind you of what it is. We'll uh, relate it to differential characteristics of the surface and the ambient derivatives of u. So what's given is u defined in the entire ambient space and some surface capital S. And we're interested in the second order rate of change in u as we approach the surface in the normal direction. So the first order rate of change is denoted by du dn. It's known as the normal derivative. This may be called the second order normal derivative. It's the second order rate of change. And a, and a geometric definition would be to draw a straight line through the point at which you're interested in that rate of change and par parametrize it by arc length, little param parameter little s, which perhaps is zero at this point, positive on this side, left, negative on this side, quite arbitrary. And then along this straight line, u becomes a function of s, little s, the arc length. Of course, u is a function of the z coordinates in the entire ambient space, but along the straight line, it's only a function of the coordinates on the arc. Uh, it's only a function of arc length. And then the first derivative is called the normal derivative. The first derivative of this function with respect to s it's called the normal derivative, and the second ordinary derivative is called this, the second order normal derivative. A completely invariant quantity. We introduce this quantity without introducing any coordinates at all. You may consider arc length as a coordinate along the straight line. That's fair, but you don't have to view it that way either. But the, mo the important thing is that we didn't introduce any coordinates in the ambient space. So this quantity is completely geometric, and what we have on the right is pure is completely tensorial. Everything's a tensor. All the indices are contracted away, so we have an invariant. Just as we would expect when we have an invariant left-hand side, of course, we want an invariant right-hand side. And the tensor property of the covariant derivative plays the crucial role here. OK. So let's go ahead and derive this property. And of course, we'll have to see some Christoffels. OK, so let's see. Uh, how we're going to do it. So we have to give equations of the straight line. And we'll just say that the straight line is given as three functions, zi of s. zi being general curvilinear coordinates defined in the ambient space. When, they, when we introduced the Cartesian coordinate in the ambient space, these were very, very simple linear functions of s. A three, a triplet, of linear functions of s. And the first derivative was very easy to figure out with respect to s. And the second derivative was 0. And that simplified the analysis quite a bit. This won't be much more complicated, but it will be more general. So let's undo the derivatives. And, re and of course, we realize that u as a function of s can be represented as, a u, as u as a function of the ambient coordinates. And then plug in the equation of the straight line into that dependence, and that's what we would have. We would have this u as a function of s given as a composite function. And of course, it's derivative. For that, we would need to differentiate this with respect to s. And that happens by the chain rule. We have du dzi, dzi ds. And let's think about these terms a little bit. So du dzi is, of course, the covariant derivative of u with respect to zi. Yes, it's a partial derivative. But recall that 
uh, for invariance or any variance of order zero, a partial derivative coincides with a covariant derivative. So this is uh, this symbol, covariant derivative of u. And now, ooh, excuse me. And now, what about this? So what you will recall from a lecture, I think it was on covariant bases, but I'll definitely add an annotation. This, of course, is the unit tangent to the curve for which this is an, the equation. So it's the unit tangent to the straight line. It's the component of the unit tangent with respect to the covariant basis. This, these derivatives are the three components of the unit tangent to the straight line, which of course makes them the components of the normal. So that's key and a key thing to review. So we have an I. An I. Okay. Now we have to take the second derivative. Let me just to, for the sake of saving some space, erase this symbol and go for the second derivative. Of course, the second derivative starts at this point right here. Not here, it's too late because these expressions have essentially been evaluated at s equals zero. We cannot ask the question, what of d n i d s, because n i is only really defined at s equals zero. So we have to go to this spot. And let's write down the second derivative by the chain rule. Well, first of, first of all, of course, it's the product rule, because there are two terms. And then this term will be analyzed by the chain rule. So we've seen enough of these. Let's do it at the same time. So for this one, uh, let me, so give me one second. I just want to think for just a moment how to organize the code. Well, let's see what happens. Let's just go. Here's what I want to do. I think I want to denote this because that's what it is by this symbol. It's more compact, so might as well use it. Okay, so then by the product rule and the chain rule for this term, we'll have d u, <laughs> excuse me, we'll have by the product rule d covariant derivative sub i of u d z j, and then dzj ds, that's completing the chain rule. And then from before we have dzi ds, dzi ds, plus this now is left unchanged. And this becomes the second derivative. Okay, let's think about this term for a little bit. So previously, it vanished because these functions that are being differentiated here were linear. So the first derivative was a constant and the second derivative vanished. But because now we're using curvilinear coordinates in the ambient space, this derivative is not zero. So, but we can get something special out of it. What is it? We still haven't taken advantage of the fact that this is a straight line. So how do we use the fact that this is a straight line? So the fact that this is a straight line would actually tell us something about this. Well, if we looked at a straight line, then we could say that it's a characteristic of a straight line, maybe even the definition of a straight line, is that it's tangent, is that, or let's call it the unit tangent, is that its unit tangent is constant from one point to another. So let's concentrate on that, the constant unit tangent, and see what would come out of it. So let me allocate this amount of the board to that discussion. So as I mentioned before, the unit tangent, let's denote it by capital T. I'm not quite sure what it was denoted by before. From a previous lecture, 
to which I'll have an annotation. Ti, the component of T, is given by dzi ds. So T itself can be written in this form. Okay. Now, because it is constant from one point to another, let's take the derivative of both sides, right? This is a constant vector as a function of s. So taking the derivatives of both sides with respect to s on the left-hand side would yield the zero vector. Let's see what we get on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, using the product rule here and then the chain rule with respect to the covariant basis equals d z i d s. Hey, look, it's this term. So we'll, that's how we'll be able to get it. z i, that's completing the product rule, plus d z i d s. And this we would analyze by the chain rule. So by the chain rule, it'll be d z i d z j. DZJ, DS. So DZI, DZJ is, of course, the Christoffel symbol shows up. That's the Christoffel symbol we've been, waiting, we've been waiting for because this Christoffel symbol will come from this term to this term and turn this partial derivative into the covariant derivative, just like we want it to. So that's where the generality of the ambient coordinate system really works out. That's the moment. So gamma. I, J, J, give me just one second. One second. ZK, ZK, that's DZI, DZJ, and now DZJ, DS, completing the chain rule. DZJ, DS. Okay, now because we have ZI here, let's rename a few indices. So, We want this z to be i, so this k becomes i. And I guess i will become k. We'll, we'll just switch them. Okay. And since this entire vector equals zero, that means its components equal zero, from which we conclude that dz, that this term equals minus this, d, z, i, the second derivative, d, s squared. Again, this is true for the straight line, equals minus gamma, i, a, j, d, z, k, d, s, d, z, j, d, s. And I feel a couple more renamings coming on, just so that we can match what we have on this side. OK, to make this expression fit into this scheme, we'll need to rename a couple more indices. We, won't, we will want to factor out these terms, which is really n, i, and j. So here, let's rename k and j into i and j, and then the free index i into k. Okay, 
and then the free index i becomes k. And just so that this expression can now fit perfectly in here, I will rename this i into k. Okay? And now I'm able to plug this expression in here, factoring out this term and this term, which of course is n i and j. So let's factor them out first, n i and j, and see that in parentheses we have this term, excuse me, minus Once again, same type of typo. Minus. Well, let's start with the Christoffel symbol. Gamma K I J U the derivative sub K of U. Okay. Great. And now, of course, you see that what we have in parentheses is precisely the covariant derivative of this object with respect to j. So we have n i and j derivative with respect to i. Of course, they commute, so I'm not paying too much attention to their order. So the second derivative of u. And by elementary index juggling, of course, we get from here to here. So I think this was a very nice derivation which shows completely general coordinates in the ambient space, and yet arrived at the exact same result without ever using any special features of any special coordinate system. It's really, whenever possible, the right way to go in sensor calculus. Thank you very much for your attention.